Mithridates realized why and how he was defeated by the Romans, and he knew he had to change up his army. So he immediately got to work and began reforming the army. He decided for the first thing was to completely take out the phalanx troops. They were useless and inefficient. They weren't good at attacking, they were only good at defense. So he took them out and implemented new swordsmen. These swordsmen had a common name. They were called Pontic Swordsmen, and that's the only thing special about them. But Mithridates needed something other than the Pontic Swordsmen. So he brought in a ton of different barbarian mercenaries, Phrygians, and other troops outside of that. But the main unit he brought in, the fiercest of these units, was the Bastarnae. They were a tribe on the Danube. They had a one-handed falx, a half-shield, and a Phrygian helmet. Mithridates took out the show of his army and made it elite and powerful. This was way better than any army he had had in the past. Mithridates faced rebellions all across the Bosphorus, and this was actually a good time because he could try out his new army, and it was perfect. It crushed the rebellions in the first few months, and they were off of the map. Sulla at this point had left Asia Minor and he appointed Morena, his general, in control of the area. And Morena, for some reason, decided to start raiding Pontus, and he was not gonna like what he got. Mithridates sent an envoy to Rome, and it fell on deaf ears. He was not gonna allow Morena to raid his territory. He sent his general Gordius at the Halus River to keep Morena distracted, and within a few moments, he arrived with his whole army and crossed the river and crushed Morena's force. Morena fleed across the Phrygian mountains. Mithridates then sent an envoy to Rome, and Sulla demanded that Morena stop raiding territory, but the damage was already done. Mithridates crushed a Roman army, and with it, he had occupied a large part of Cappadocia. He, Mithridates practically insulted the Romans at this point, beating an army and then occupying territory he wasn't supposed to. And Rome couldn't do anything about this. He was too strong. Mithridates was pushing his weight around, and the Romans knew it. Archelaus, Mithridates' favorite general, was fearing for his life and had to flee Pontus, and he defected to the Romans, as Mithridates would have probably had him killed. Now, the Roman appointed king in Cappadocia, Ariobazanes, was complaining to Rome that Mithridates um, occupied some of his territory, and Myth and Rome sent some envoys to Mithridates and reluctantly he uh, stepped out of Cappadocia. He didn't want to go to war just yet. And once again, the tricky Pontic king asked Tigranes II of Armenia to take Cappadocia so he wouldn't be seen as the aggressor. And Tigranes did it again. And Sertorius, the rebel general in Spain, was war warring against Rome and sent some advisors to Pontus so that they would become allies, and the advisors would stay with Pontus for a while. Now this wasn't the reason the Third Mithridatic War started. The reason was because the childless king Nicomedes made Rome the heir to his kingdom, and Mithridates could not allow this to happen, and he declared war when Nicomedes died. The Third Mithridatic War had started. Mithridates made his move, and in the same year, invaded Nicomedia and crushed a few legions that were in the area. Now, the two governors of that time, Luke's, Lucius Lucinius Lucullus and Marcus Aurelius Cotta, had a plan. Cotta would attack from sea and invade up to Sinope in Pontus, and Lucullus would attack from land. A two-pronged attack would crush Pontus. But Mithridates was not going to allow them to attack him in two different areas. And Cotta, who began to gather his fleet, was too slow. And Mithridates blockaded his fleet and attacked by land and sea and crushed the army. Mithridates left, left a small force at Tenidos, which is on the coast of Asia Minor. And he himself besieged Cyzicus, which is also on the coast of Asia Minor. And at this point, Lucullus came into the region and beat back the forces that were at Tenedos. Now, Cyzicus, the town that Mithridates besieged, is very hard to explain, so I'm going to do it as best as I can, but I'm not going to be 100% accurate. When you come from the east to Cyzicus, 
there's a river, and then when you besiege the town and place your men in the small field that there is, you have the city in front of you on a peninsula, and behind you there's a mountain range. Further behind that mountain range is another river, which you will later see will kind of screw Mithridates up. Now, if you're coming in from the west side, there is a passage, and it actually has a road, but Mithridates had a strong garrison here. He was ready for an all-out siege. Now, Sertorius, the guy I mentioned before, who was in Spain, had been assassinated, and the advisors were eager to get back to Rome. So, they began secret communications with Lucullus, and convinced Mithridates to leave the pass open. This was a big mistake, and Lucullus was able to get up on the mountain range, and Mithridates was surrounded between a city and a massive Roman army. Now, I'm not one to throw out humongous armies like these historians do, but the only army size that I could find is given to us, and it is said that Mithridates had 300,000 soldiers. This is almost impossible. And the reason I say that is because Pontus, yes, it had a lot of manpower, and yes, Mithridates remade the army, and yes, it had a lot of mercenaries. But still, 300,000 men cramped on a peninsula? That's almost impossible. I think the number was probably more around 100 to 200,000. The first time Mithridates tried to get in Sisychus, he put 3,000 Sisychian prisoners on some ships, hoping that the citizens would let him in, but they didn't. So he constructed a massive tower and put it on two ships and sent it towards the city. And initially this worked. It broke through and the Pontus, Pontic forces had got in the town. But the Sisychians, fighting for their lives, rallied and pushed the Pont Pontic forces out of the t town. Mithridates then tried the land siege. He multiple times attacked the city with siege towers, but these were almost always repulsed. But once again, the Pontic forces broke through and began attacking the army inside Sisychus. But the citizens, once again fighting for their lives, had erected a second wall and began pushing the Pontic forces out again. And then, to even weaken the Pontic morale further, a massive storm came and destroyed all of the siege engines Mithridates had just created. Mithridates then realizing his cavalry was pretty useless in a siege and they were just taking up food, sent them away, but Lucullus, who was waiting on the hill, ambushed them and crushed the cavalry. Winter eventually came, and with it, a plague and food shortage. shortage. Mithridates was forced to leave as the Sisychians began constantly filing out of the town and attacking his army. And with plague and no food, he had to leave Sisychus. Lucullus, who was waiting on the hillside, when Mithridates' army's army left, he began attacking it with his cavalry. But Mithridates began attacking Lucullus with his cavalry, and both forces won and lost some minor battles. At this point, Mithridates fled Pontus. His army was down to 20,000 soldiers from a supposed 300,000. Mithridates constantly attacked Lucullus as he chased him. And this is one of the most epic parts in history. Lucullus chases um, Mithridates through Armenia, and Mithridates constantly annoys him, and Lucullus was furious as he couldn't catch Mithridates. He eluded the grasp of Lucullus multiple times. Mithridates eventually made it to the court of Tigranes II, and he was sad to see Mithridates, as he didn't want to fight the Romans, but for, to help his father-in-law regain his kingdom and to fight for the Middle East independence, he would fight for Pontus and Armenia. Eventually, all of Asia Minor was in Roman control, and Lucullus sent envoys to Mithridates' son in the Bosphorus, who betrayed his father and took over all of it. At this point, Lucullus demanded that Tigranes surrendered Mithridates, but fighting for his independence, Tigranes II refused to give up to Mithridates. Lucull Lucullus had about 32,000 infantry and 10,000 cavalry and began advancing on Tigranokerta, which is the Armenian capital. Now Mithridates pleaded with Tigranes II not to engage the Romans in combat. However, Tigranes, who called himself the King of Kings, had 250,000 soldiers with him, including 10,000 cataphracts 
which is kind of like a mini tank. There was a fully armored horse and a fully armored rider. These guys were unstoppable if got, they got a charge on. Now the battlefield at Tigranokerta was pretty terrible for a big army. Now the way Tigranus came onto the field, he had a river to his left, a hill further to the left of that, then on his right a full hill of terrain. Like this was all hilly terrain and he went right in to a gorge of death. Lucullus hid the most of his army as he had a master plan and this plan would prove to be Tigranus's downfall. Tigranus II saw the Roman army and said it's too small to be an army but too big to be an envoy. Tigranus began marching back to Tigranokerta and to his surprise thousands of Romans came surging down the hill on the right side. Tigranus's cataphracts were attacked and they panicked and turned back and hit his own army and Lucullus bringing up the rest of his forces continued to attack the main army and it was almost completely destroyed. Lucullus then chased Tigranus II to Artaxata where he beat him again and Tigranes threw himself to the, on the feet of Lucullus, pleading that he would be allowed to keep his kingdom. And he would, but he would become a client state, a shadow of his former glory. And Mithridates was far from complete with the Romans. He made a beeline back to Pontus, and at the Battle of Zela, he beat a small Roman garrison there. And Lucullus could have killed the consul that was defending the area. He just did all of that work, and now Mithridates occupied his kingdom once again. Lucullus then fled Armenia, as he didn't want to be encircled by Pontus. And his army had mutinied, and he was replaced by Gnaeus Pompey. And at this point, Mithridates was outnumbered, and near the town of Lycus, Pompey destroyed the Mithridatic army. Mithridates was far from beaten. He then, with only a few thousand soldiers, left Pontus and began peppering the Romans. Every time Pompey would come out to chase Mithridates, he would attack his supply lines again and again and again. Using his Scythian horsemen, they were light, agile, and fierce, and he was able to hit the sides of the Romans at all times. Pompey was going basically insane. Mithridates was destroying him with nothing, basically. However, Mithridates' army was caught off guard. Pompey, Pompey managed to get up on the ridge that Mithridates had encamped his army on and attacked the Pontic fort. Mithridates' army was once again destroyed and he barely made it out alive. Mithridates ran to the Bosphorus and killed his treacherous son. Pompey, who couldn't even get past the mountains of the Caucasus, had to fall back into Pontus because the tribes were too hostile, they were, they were allied with Mithridates at this point, and he couldn't even get up there. Mithridates was safe for now. Mithridates woke up, and to his horror, his son, Pharnacus II, had rallied the Pontic troops who were tired, exhausted, and weary from war. They wanted to go back home, and they mutinied against Mithridates. Mithridates, though, he wasn't actually that worried, and he just tried to rally his own soldiers and counterattack Pharnacus, but this wasn't happening. They joined Pharnacus' side and turned against their king. Mithridates, with his two daughters his, and his bodyguard, fled to a tower and locked themselves in. And this, my friends, is where the journey comes to an end. Mithridates' daughters ran up to him, clenching their father in their arms. They cried, they didn't know what was going to happen, and they pleaded that Mithridates would give them some poison so they could take their own lives and not be captured by their treacherous brother. And this request was granted. Mithridates gave his daughters some poison and they took their lives. Mithridates had one last trick. He would have his bodyguard pretend to surrender to Pharnacus, and then... Ha try and kill Pharnacus when he's looking away. But Pharnacus knew his father's tricks, and as soon as the bodyguard came down out of the tower, they were all cut to the ground. When Mithridates realized this, a tear fell from his cheek and nail hit the ground. 
he realized that after decades, it was finally over. He took a dose of poison, but it didn't kill him. He tried maybe getting some exercise to hope that the poison could not maybe activate and try and kill him, but it wasn't happening. He was too strong. He had built up a massive immune system and wasn't going to be killed by poison. Mithridates, with shaking arms and a teary face, turned to his bodyguard. He had him stab Mithridates in the chest, killing him immediately. The bodyguard then took his own life. Pharnacus then broke into the tower, cut Mithridates' head off, and sent it back to Pompey. Pompey was satisfied and would allow Pharnacus to keep the boss for us. Now you can sit here and say Mithridates was a bad commander, a bad general, a bad administrator, but I don't think that. I think Mithridates was a hero, fighting for his freedom. He stood up for everyone in Asia Minor when no one stood up for him. He single-handedly fought the Romans again and again, despite being beaten again and again. I like to put it as this. Mithridates was a brave falcon fighting for his freedom and his territory, and Rome was a never-satisfied wolf killing anything in its path to gain more and more. Mithridates is a hero because of the stuff he did, and the reason I say that is, let's look at his childhood. The guy literally wrestled lions and bears in his teens. He captured an untamed horse at the age of 10 and tamed it on the spot. He spoke 20 different languages. He became immune to poison. You get what I'm saying. He was a genius. Not only was he a genius, but he was the last hope for Asia and the Middle East. And when the people of Asia prayed for a king to come, and when they saw that comet, they knew one had came. But when Mithridates rose to power and stood up fiercely against the Romans again and again and again, nobody stood up for him. Mithridates would do anything in his power to beat Rome. And yeah, you can sit here and say, well, what if the full power of Rome was on Mithridates? Well, he would have probably been beaten, but that's what makes the story awesome. And what I mean by that is, well, look at Rome, fighting the Punic Wars, fighting the Cimbrian War, fight just getting done with the Greek Wars. Mithridates was standing in the back with a knife, ready to execute Rome. And yeah, the Siege of Sisychus was a military disaster. He lost hundreds of thousands of troops. But who do you know who ran in the wilderness, fighting constantly, day and night, when his army had practically deserted him? Nobody. And that's what makes Mithridates special from anybody in history. And with that, my friends, Mithridates and the Pontic Wars are over. Pharnacus would later come back and rage a fourth Pontic War, but he would lose at Zela. He was nothing of what Mithridates was. The journey of Mithridates comes to an end, and with it, this series. I really enjoyed doing this series. It was very fun. It was short but I liked it, and I'm definitely going to be doing more documentaries in the future. I hope you guys enjoyed, and I hope to see you watching my videos.